Welcome to Equipping the Body. I'm Dr. Brad Starnes, and today we're continuing our study through the book of Luke. And we've now finished Luke chapter 7 and come to Luke chapter number 8. And now Luke 8 is another longer chapter in Luke's writing, and it contains the famous parable of the sower. It tells of the time Jesus stilled the winds and the waves. It also tells of the time that Jesus healed the demoniac of Gadara. It has the healing of the woman with the issue of blood, the healing of Jairus' daughter. It is just an action-packed chapter. But it begins in the first three verses, Luke provides a succinct summary of the Savior's ministry. It is an overview of sorts. So while often when we find such passages, we tend to skim over them to get to the exciting part, if you will. However, in so doing, we often miss the meat that's meant for our maturing. So we don't want to do that. We want to look at this summary in detail and glean from it the timeless truths of this text. Now before I read the text and begin our exposition, I want to ask you to consider, those of you that are saved, those of you that are in a local church serving, what will be said of your church's ministry when you and the generation that's serving there now is long gone? What will be said? How will it be summarized, if you will? I think we need to ask ourselves that whenever we see a summary of the Savior's ministry. Now, obviously, you and I cannot raise the dead, okay? <laughs> We're not walking around healing people just by smacking them or looking at them. You know, not that Jesus smacked them, but you, you get the point. Um, so it's not going to be identical. But again, how will our ministry be summarized? And how will that compare to the summary of the Savior's ministry? So I want to just look at Luke's summary of the Savior's ministry. So let's read our text, Luke 8, 1 through 3. Now it came to pass afterward that he went through every city and village, preaching and bringing the glad tidings of the kingdom of God. And the twelve were with him, and certain women who had been healed of evil spirits and infirmities. Mary, called Magdalene, out of whom he had come seven, uh, excuse me, out of whom had come seven demons. Joanna, the wife of Chusa, Herod's steward and Susanna, and many others who provided for him from their substance. At a first glance, it's like, okay, you know, this is the people Jesus hang out with. Great, let's get to the good part. But there's so much here in this, these three verses. The first thing I want you to notice about Luke's summary of the Savior's ministry comes to us in verse 1, part A, and I want you to consider the places of the Savior's ministry, the places. What I mean by that? Well, our text says it came to pass afterward that he went through every city and village. Now stop right there, full stop. We have the places of the Savior's ministry, every city and village, from the big cities to the small country towns, Jesus did not discriminate. He preached the gospel wherever he went, wherever, from Jerusalem to little bitty Nain, Jesus preached everywhere he went. Now, many ministries today seek to minister only in large places because the logic goes more money, more people, bigger ministry. And so that's they put all their focus on those large areas. And yet that's not what Jesus did. Jesus preached anywhere and everywhere he went. The places of the Savior's ministry. Too many are consumed with numbers. Now you say, Pastor, what's, what's wrong with that? Well, nothing, unless in so doing, we ignore the unchurched areas of our world, the places that are small towns and small lower income families, etc., and we ignore doing ministry there in favor of doing ministry in other places. Then one would have to wonder of the motivation. Is it ministry or megalomania? Jesus did not minister in this way. 
He, the places of his ministry, the text is clear. Every city and village. I mean, big city, small village, Jesus was preaching. The places of the Savior's ministry. Now, how does this apply to us? Simply in this way. We must purpose to reach all the places we can. The Great Commission says, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, not just Ennery, but Woodruff. This applies to me because I live in Ennery. Not just Woodruff, but Spartanburg County. Not just Spartanburg County, but South Carolina. Not just South Carolina, but the USA. Not just the USA, but the world. Which is why at our church, we're involved in local ministry. For example, I teach at Good News Club at Woodruff Elementary every Thursday and enjoy doing it. And we have our first responders breakfast on National First Responders Day, our fall festival, vacation Bible school. But then we have international ministries. We finance two, uh, excuse me, three missionary families that are in the field right now, two in South America, one in Thailand. We finance them directly, not through, not through a conglomerate. I, we support them, their bank account, on a monthly basis so they can be over there and minister. And then we also give to our denominational missions. So we don't want to ignore this place or that place. We want to emulate Jesus and say every city and village. So we have the places of his ministry. But secondly, in verse 1, we find the practice of the Savior's ministry. What was the practice? Well, the text tells us. He went through every city and village. What was he doing? Here we go. Preaching and bringing the glad tidings of the kingdom of God. There it is. The practice of the Savior's ministry was to proclaim and propagate the good news of the kingdom. To spread the message of Jesus Christ by way of preaching. Not by way of programs, though they have their place. Not by way of entertainment. Not by way of singing, though nobody enjoys singing more than me, but by the God-ordained method of preaching and teaching the Word of God. By sharing one's faith with family, friends, and co-workers, we too are propagators of the gospel. Not promoters of a product, but heralds of a holy message. That's so nice it must be said twice. We are not to be promoters of a product, but heralds of a holy message. And that message is this, that Jesus came into the world to seek and to save sinners from eternal damnation, and that by trusting in his person and work, one will inherit eternal life. That was Jesus' practice. Jesus didn't go around with surveys asking goats what they would like in a church. By the way, we're called to feed the sheep, not entertain the goats. Jesus didn't conduct surveys. <laughs> Jesus didn't go ask unsaved people what their opinion is on saved things. That's not what he did. He didn't go around and say, who can put on the craziest, wildest, quote, worship set? No, sir. Jesus preached the gospel. He brought the glad tidings. Now, the phrase in English, bringing the glad tidings, is one word in Greek, and it's euangelizo where we get our word evangelism, evangelizing. Now, we know what evangelism is. It's the spreading of the salvation's message to the unconverted. By what means? Well, we have personal evangelism. Now, personal evangelism is when you simply share your faith with a lost person. And I don't mean your testimony. I mean your faith, the faith once delivered for the saints, the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ and how to be saved. You have lifestyle evangelism where we're to live holy lives in front of those who are lost. And by the way, lifestyle evangelism, fine, well, and good, but it's not enough because the Bible's clear. They cannot believe on him of whom they have not heard. How shall they hear without a preacher? Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Jesus said, he that hath ears to hear, let him hear. And so don't give me this news, well, preacher, I just try to, I don't want to say nothing because I don't want to hurt nobody or make nobody mad, so I just try to be nice and be a witness. You're not being a witness, you're being a coward. We're called to tell people Jesus saves. I like John the Baptist. He just stood up and said, repent, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. He just pointed to Jesus and said, there he is, 
Behold the Lamb of God which takes away the sin of the world. We are to speak, verbally proclaim, propagate the message of Jesus Christ. So we have the practice of the Savior's ministry. That's what he did. He preached. He told people the good news. And so we have evangelism. Now, you know, a lot of people, well, you're just saying that because you're a preacher. No, sir. No, ma'am. 1 Corinthians 1, 21b through 24 confirms what I've been teaching and what Jesus did, that God chose verbal communication of the Bible as his primary means of saving sinners and equipping saints. When we try to replace preaching with programs or witnessing with wonders, we have missed the mark and the consequences will be dire. And that's exactly why we have buildings, I won't call them churches, filled with people who are lost, who have no grasp of the basic teachings of the Bible, who even though they say they are Christian become offended by the most basic truths of the Bible. That's why we have churches teaching things that are just horrifically, diametrically opposed to Scripture. For example, when you see a church that teaches LGBTQ, whatever, is okay and normal, that's a result of a church that replaced preaching with programs a long time ago, that replaced truth with man's tradition a long time ago. And so don't tell me, well, you know, you're just one of those super conservative guys. No, I'm just, I'm just telling you. It's the foolishness of preaching that God chose to save those who believe. And everywhere I see Jesus go, he preaches. He preaches, and he preaches it straight down the line from the book. Jesus was an expositor of God's word. Paul said it pleased God. See, that's the problem. We're, we're too busy trying to please people instead of trying to please God. It pleased God through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe or through the foolishness of preaching. For the Jews request a sign and Greeks seek after wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified to the Jews a stumbling block and to the Greeks foolishness, but to those who are called both Jews and Greeks Christ the power of God, and the wisdom of God. It is the preaching of the gospel that is God's primary practice. And brothers and sisters, we had better get busy practicing what God purposed. So we have the practice of the Savior's ministry. And then finally we have, or not finally, excuse me, thirdly, we have the people of the Savior's ministry. I love this. The text lists some people that were involved in the Savior's ministry. It says the 12 were with him and certain women. And it lists Mary Magdalene, Joanna, and Susanna, and many others. Talk about a mixed crowd. Now I love this, the people of the Savior's ministry, because it teaches us that Jesus used, first of all, common people. It's often been said that God loves common people. That's why he made so many of them. That God uses common people. Peter was a common man, a fisherman, blue collar, working man, no formal education, no riches, just a regular guy. And God used him to write two books of the Bible to shepherd the early church at Rome and to be part of Jesus' inner circle, Peter, James, and John. Talk about a resume. But he was a common guy. Well, these people mentioned in the Savior's ministry also show us that God not only uses common people, but God uses wealthy people. Matthew, the tax collector, was wealthy. Well, how do you know that? Because I studied New Testament history, and I studied the ancient world in seminary, and the tax collectors, let me tell you, they cleaned up pretty nicely. Matthew was wealthy, and God used him. God used him. Isn't that something? Not only does God use common people and wealthy people, but we find Mary Magdalene listed here, and that tells us that God uses people with a sinful past. Since she had seven demons, 
Seven, the number of completion, demons, wicked. She was completely wicked, if you want to look at it in that way. She had a horrible past. But God's not like us. God doesn't look at somebody and say, well, you know, I remember him in high school. I remember how she used to be. Oh, no, sir. When your sin is put under the blood of Jesus Christ, it's gone. It's gone. God has forgiven it and illegally forgotten it, and you need to forget about it. God can use people with a sinful past, a really bad past. We're all sinners, but this speaks of somebody who is just, uh, we would say, just vehemently wicked, and yet God can use them because God saves from the guttermost to the uttermost. The people of the Savior's ministry. Not only people with a sinful past, but unlikely people. Well, where'd you get that from? Well, the text tells us Joanna, the wife of Chusa, Herod's steward. Now, Herod was a wicked man. You remember Herod? Chopped off John the Baptist's head. And he hired wicked men. So it's safe to say that Chusa was a wicked devil. And we can only imagine the type of woman that a man like that would want to marry. So God uses unlikely people. The last person anybody would have thought to be a follower of Christ would be somebody that works in close relation and is with, in cahoots with, Herod the Tetrarch. Who in the world would have thought that girl? Really? It's like the kid that always gets picked last for dodgeball. The unlikely hero. God uses unlikely people. You're listening to a guy right now that 20 years ago, dare I say 15 years ago, maybe even some would say 10 years ago, people would tell you that kid will never amount to anything. Forget about it. He's a bad kid. He's a bad guy. And I was. I was a sinner. But now I'm a trophy of God's grace. God uses unlikely people. I'll never forget. I was 15. Riding the bus. Home from Swafford Career Center. And a bus driver. She said, you are a loser. And you will never amount to anything. Can you imagine if a school employee talked to a kid like that today? They'd put him in jail. But that's what she told me in front of other students. She said, you are a loser and you will never amount to anything. So let me tell you something. In some ways, she was right. That is until I met Jesus Christ. And he changed my life. Radically changed my life. God uses unlikely people. And so when we read that Joanna, wife of Chusa, Herod Stewart, was in this crowd helping the Savior minister, we should not be surprised. Because God uses common people, wealthy people, people with a sinful past. And thank God he uses unlikely people. Considering the people of the Savior's ministry, we can rightly conclude that God will use and can use anybody. He's not looking for the qualified, but he's looking for the willing. He used common people, wealthy people, people with particularly sinful past, and unlikely people. It's often been said that God does not uh, call the equipped. He equips the called. That's a good way to look at it. Now, you may be listening to this. You say, well, God can't use me. I'm broke. Well, he used Peter. Or God cannot use me because I used to be this or I used to be that. Well, I promise you, if Mary Magdalene was here, she'd say, let me tell you what Jesus can do. It does not matter. You say, well, you know, I'm just a good old boy. Well, Peter was just a good old boy. Never meaning no harm, you know, kind of like the Duke boys. And God used him. I'm glad to tell you that God uses people who are willing to be used of him. So we see the people 
of the Savior's ministry as Luke gives us this list of people. And then finally, we come to the provision of the Savior's ministry. Now, this is important. We saw the places. We saw the people. We saw the practice. Now we need to look at the provision of the Savior's ministry. The text says this statement. And many others, watch this, who provided for him, capital H, talking about Jesus, from where? From their substance. That means they provided for his ministry financially. It is the responsibility of God's people to contribute to the ministry God has placed them in. We're not to go around begging for the world's money. We're to tithe and to give offerings above our tithe when and where needed. We are to give systematically on the Lord's day. A ministry must be financed. Ministry takes money. They don't let missionaries go overseas for free. <laughs> and believe it or not, pastor's kids have to eat something every now and again too. And the power company doesn't give the church a break on its light bill. Ministry takes money. And Jesus ran a shoestring budget, but he still had to have something. And so we see the provision for the Savior's ministry. Many others from their substance, their substance. Let me tell you what you're doing when you hold back from the local church God has placed you in financially. And I'm not preaching health, wealth, and prosperity. And Lord knows I'm not preaching for my own self because I'm going to tell you something. If I was in it for the money, I'd have done something besides being a pastor. And I know my fellow pastors say amen right there. That's not the point. The point is it's biblical to support the ministry of God. It's not just practical. It's biblical. You say, well, Pastor, you mentioned the tithe. Now, i got a problem with that because I'm not under the Old Testament law, Pastor. Well, that's cute. Neither was Abraham. I'm sure some of your jaws just dropped. And Abraham gave his tithe to Melchizedek, who everybody knows. Whether you think he was literally a pre-incarnate Christ or not, we know, we all agree, he was a type and shadow of Jesus Christ. The book of Hebrews even tells us that in not so many words. Abraham tithed before the Mosaic law. Tithing is not a law. Tithing is a principle. And it's, it's, it was around before the law. It's around now in the New Testament church age and the church dispensation we live in now. Tithing ain't going nowhere, honey. That's not a law. That's a principle. So I'm just telling you, I've heard that argument too, but you need to read your Bible a little closer. Because as far as I know, or at least as far as the Bible tells me, Abraham was paying tithes long before Moses came on the scene with the tablets and the law at Sinai. And you say, well, you know, past we don't get... Well, these people did. The Bible clearly says they gave to him from their substance the provision of the savior's ministry it is our job as christians to financially and with our time and our talent and our treasure as the old saying goes to support the ministry of the bible believing local church god has placed us in that's biblical and i'm not going to get into this whole well i can be a christian and not be part of a church well the bible says you can't but i'm that's a different sermon for a different day the scripture is clear. So when you disagree with it, you're not disagreeing with Brad Starnes. I didn't write the Bible. This was written before I was born. You're not disagreeing with me. You're disagreeing with God. And I'll let you sort that out with him. But we have the provision of the Savior's ministry. In conclusion, we've seen Luke's summary of the Savior's ministry. We noted the places of the Savior's ministry. He went in every city, in every village. We noticed the practice of the Savior's ministry, preaching and bringing the glad tidings. We noticed the people of the Savior's ministry. There was common people in that list, wealthy people in that list, unlikely people in that list, and people with sinful past in that list. God can use anybody. And then finally, we noted the provision of, of the Savior's ministry, that as God's people, we have a holy responsibility to provide for the ministry of God. I hope you've enjoyed studying just these three little verses, but so much meat meant for our maturing.
as Christians. God bless you. Keep studying the book of Luke. And I'll be back with you next time.